Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm the past president of the North American Menopause Society, and I'm here today hosting conversations with experts that bring information to you. Our first guest is Dr. Petlin Batur. She did both her internal medicine residency and women's health subspecialty fellowship training at the Cleveland Clinic. She's been practicing there since 1998. Her areas of expertise include medically complex contraception, menopausal care, menstrual migraine, and sexual concerns. And after 15 years of balancing primary care and being a consultant in women's health practice, she's transitioned now to a purely women's health consultation practice. She's helped set up several programs within the obstetrics and gynecology department for the care of women with medically complex situations, such as after cancer treatment, organ transplant, or in those who carry genetic conditions which increase their cancer risk. So let's talk about a topic that often is very confusing for healthcare providers, contraception in and around the perimenopause. Is this something that we really need to be counseling our patients about? Definitely. Um, so when you look at rates of unintended pregnancy in women who are in their 40s, surprisingly, the rates are pretty high comparable to other age groups, including adolescents. Um, obviously, the live birth rates are not as high, but still, it can be quite distressing to have an unintended pregnancy when you're not ready for it or you're not medically fit for it. Um, so I do like to start the conversation with what would an unintended pregnancy mean to you? Would it be a blessing or, you know, would this throw a curve? ball in your life? And would this be a detriment to the fetus's health or your health? So we have to always consider the possibility of pregnancy, um, including in the patients that we think oftentimes are not going to get pregnant. So in our menopause clinic, we'll see women after um, cancer, where they had hypothalamic hypogonadism, or after, you know, they have a um, they have a terrible renal disease, um, and then when they get their transplant, now they can ovulate. So all these women should be assumed to have a chance to have pregnancy, uh, assumed to uh, possibly get pregnant until proven otherwise. Okay, so let's talk about these women in terms of the contraceptives that are available to them, and what is <clears throat> commonly used during menopause and during perimenopause, and what can we offer them? Yeah, so it's really the medical history, not the age, that determines a woman's eligibility for, um, for the particular contraceptive. So women in general have the full gamut of options that younger women do. Um, if they're particularly high risk, um, we, you know, almost anyone can use a non-hormonal contraceptive. Um, obviously, condoms aren't going to be the uh, are not going to be quite as effective. We're looking at 15 to 20 out of 100 women having an unintended pregnancy using that method, um, but something like a copper IUD is going to be an option uh, for many women. Um, you know, if you're needing bleeding control, progestin-only options uh, can be very helpful. Uh, the very few con uh, contraindications to progestin-only methods, um, unless they have, you know, recently treated breast cancer or they are on medications that might impact the metabolism. Many, many women can uh, tolerate a progestin-only contraceptive. However, if women are having terrible symptoms, they're probably gonna need a little bit of estrogen, and that's where we have to weigh the risks and the benefits, and we're most concerned about arterial or venous thromboembolism. So if we have a perimenopausal woman where we're concerned about contraception, but also she's having the onset of vasomotor symptoms. Many of our patients have terrible vasomotor symptoms, even with the presence of their, of their periods. So any of these that you would think of more as doing due diligence and certain, and, you know, contraception on one hand, but perhaps helping some of the perimenopausal symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I think of um, the list of contraceptive options in my mind for someone who's in her younger years, you know, we, we think about what's the most effective, right? We think of the um, long-acting methods and then the um, patient-controlled methods as a second tier. But in the 40s, I'm a lot less worried about how effective the contraceptive is. Um, I'm more worried about, you know, fitting the risks as well as the benefits. So the low-dose estrogen-containing contraceptive is absolutely an option and is going to be better uh, for a woman who's having bad perimenopausal symptoms, which includes, like you said, the vasomotor symptoms, the sleep issues, mood concerns, but also hirsutism, you know, loss of hair, acne, hair where you don't want it, um, and then menstrual migraines, 
can actually get worse during the perimenopausal time. So when we think about all these, the estrogen containing products are gonna do a better job. And it's oftentimes abnormal uterine bleeding can be best controlled with a hormonal contraceptive if a woman is looking for reliable cycle control. What about some of the higher risks that we should be focusing on during perimenopause? What advice do you have for us? Yeah, so really what we're worried about, venous and thromboembolism. So thinking about those risks, if a woman is healthy, takes leads a good lifestyle, then she has a full gamut of options. I do like to stick to 20 micrograms or less because we do know that, you know, when you drop the estrogen dose, um, that you do increase the arterial and venous thromboembolism risks, but not necessarily. It depends on her history. However, if we're getting into a lot of, um, lot of arterial risks, such as she has uncontrolled controlled blood pressure, she has diabetes with the complication or combination of multiple risk factors, and also recognizing that obesity is a risk factor not only for arterial but also for venous thromboembolic events. Um, then, you know, I'm either going to go towards the ultra-low dose um, estrogens, also can consider a levonorgestrel IUD with a very small dose of postmenopausal estrogen, um, or, you know, really extensive counseling and always encouraging women to make sure they're controlling their risk factors and leading as healthy of a lifestyle as they can. So often in these women, if they go on a low dose birth control pill, they often will ask us as providers, how do I know then when I'm in menopause, how do I know when I can stop the birth control pill? Right. That's a great question. Comes up every day in clinic. And the honest answer is that we just don't know because the hormone testing is not um, accurate, especially in those situations. But the hormone testing is sometimes not accurate in defining menopause anyways. Many times it's not accurate. So it really is. Uh, I tell women, we're going to take this one year at a time. See if you're ultimate, what are your goals? Are you still getting more net benefits? Um, as a, what are, as Have your medical risk factors changed? And we re reassess yearly. Um, and Really, if a woman is otherwise healthy, we can use birth control pills up until the mid-50s, around age 55, and then transition over to hormone replacement. And this is where levonorgestrel IUD options is nice because then, you know, we can just treat with whatever dose estrogen we need because we know we're um, guaranteed the protection from the pregnancy and the uterus endometrium. So for a woman who's on a low-dose birth control pill, and if you do happen to measure the FSH, many practitioners will say, well, if the FSH is high, it's a good indication that they're menopausal. Word of advice on that? Yeah, I guess I'm just conservative by nature. I mean, odds are maybe in your favor, but the, you know, the contraceptives do impact um, FSH levels. And in fact, now we have some good evidence that even uh, levonorgestrel IUDs can impact the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis and the hormones. So I'm, I, once you've seen a few women told that they're in menopause and they become pregnant, you know, late 40s, 51, uh, you know, it, it just makes you a little nervous. So I'm a little gun shy. So I always conservative. All it takes, I always say all it takes is one egg and one sperm. Um, so I That's do, okay. uh, yeah. So I'm always a little hesitant to diagnose menopause based on labs. I always tell people uh, menopause, we're going to define as one year without periods in the absence of any hormones or medical conditions that's going to impact those periods. And I rely less on lab testing, especially if they're on a hormonal contraceptive. Such an important point. Before I let you go, any other takeaways for the audience that you would like to tell us? Yeah, I think the big takeaway from any contraceptive lecture or discussion is that the risks of an unintended pregnancy for a woman always uh, outweigh or are always higher than the risks of a um, contraceptive. So we just want to keep that in mind. Of course, we want to use whatever is safest, but if she has an unintended pregnancy, not only is that a, a sometimes an emotional stress if she's not ready for it, but also a physical stress on the body. And I think, you know, before we go, just the concept that many women don't think that they're at risk for pregnancy, and often we may not bring it up, which may give them the impression that their impression is correct. So, so important to have this conversation with your patients, particularly, as you say, an unwanted pregnancy at this stage of the game could be devastating. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.